All right, everybody, welcome back, and I'm happy to welcome back to the show David Fromm. He is a contributing writer for The Atlantic. He's the author of Trumpocalypse, among many other excellent books, and he's a great friend of the show. David Fromm, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I want to start with former Attorney General Bill Barr, who, after having said all sorts of bad things about Donald Trump, uh, now says he's going to vote for him and that he's the lesser of two evils. I want to show you this clip of CNN's Caitlin Collins uh, and get your reaction on the other side. So just to be clear, you're voting for someone who you believe tried to subvert the peaceful transfer of power that can't even achieve his own policies, that lied about the election even after his attorney general told him that the election wasn't stolen. And as the former chief law enforcement in this country, you're going to vote for someone who is facing 88 criminal counts. Oh, look, the 88 criminal counts, a lot of those are, in my, and I've said- Even if are, 10 of them are accurate? The answer to the question is yes. I'm supporting, I'm supporting the Republican ticket. But and can I, you say that you're and, voting and for Donald Trump? Because you're not saying his name. You just say you're supporting the Republican ticket. I've said, I, as between Biden and Trump, I will vote for Trump. All right, so that, that puts him in the same category with uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu, and now we have Bill Barr, all of whom said horrible things about Trump, You know, basically that he's unfit for office, if you add it all up, uh, and they're voting for him. What do you make of that, David? Well, I won't enter into the personalities here because I think these are all very different kinds of people. And, and Mitch McConnell has been very effective at holding some of Donald Trump's worst instincts at bay and the money to Ukraine is flowing. So I put him in a different category from some of the others. Um, Barr did a lot of – Chris Sununu you know, has, is a television presence and a, a, a governor, but he has not done kind of harm to the fabric of American society in a way that Bill Barr did. But let me just leave all of that aside to just deal with the merits of the argument. Um, so let's take for granted that Bill Barr believes the things he does. Is it smart from his point of view to advocate for Trump in 2024 as opposed to Biden? And the way I would invite Republicans of conservative bent to think about this is what if Hillary Clinton had prevailed in 2016? Where would you be today? And my contention is you, by your own lights and for your own goals, would be much better off today if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016. So let's go back to that election. Um, re uh, Republicans held the House and Senate in 2016. So a President Clinton would have been pretty constrained in what she was able to do. Uh, in 2018, because of President Trump, Republicans took massive losses in the House and, and down ballot too. Uh, in, uh, under President Clinton, they wouldn't presumably, it's, it, that would have been year 10 of Democratic presidency. Uh, that's a formula for losing a lot of seats in, in the House. Republicans would have kept and expanded their majority instead. Um, then in 2020, they would have done better up and down the ballot. Uh, you would have had the, the Democrats asking for a fourth consecutive presidential term. Unless your name is Franklin Roosevelt, you don't get those. They would have lost in 2020. And the Republic, you would now have a Republican president and a Republican House and Senate in 2021. And that's, you know, not even factoring in the damage that would have been done to the party of the president by the COVID pandemic and the summer of George Floyd, all of which would have redounded to Republican benefit in 2020. So there wouldn't have been a tax cut in 2017, but there would be one in 2021. Uh, Republicans would not have been able to remake the Supreme Court uh, as they did. So that would have been a loss. On the other hand, that means Roe versus Wade would still be intact and Republicans could be merrily complaining about it instead of coping with the catastrophic consequences for them of it not being there. They were better off when Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. And you didn't mobilize the 70 percent majority of Americans who don't agree with Republican point of view to vote against Republicans, not only for president, but for Senate, House, state legislatures, governor's races, all the way down the ballot. And so I invite Barr to think, if Biden wins in 2024, Republicans will have a huge year in 2026. Uh, they will be well positioned to win the presidency in 2028. Trump will be gone. And you will have someone who, even by Barr standards, is much more acceptable to him. Whereas if Trump does win, in 2024, we are on a path to unending crisis because it's not like the rest of the society will meekly stand down when Trump blows up the legal system. There will be crisis upon crisis. And if Democrats win the House in 2018, sorry, in 2024, as I think they're likely to do, we're on our way to a third impeachment crisis. And how is that any good for anybody? 
I mean, you make some valid points, and I, I certainly think in the case of Donald Trump, um, you you are probably right. I would ask, though, couldn't you say um, about a lot of presidents? So it's like if Al Gore had won in 2000, Republicans might have been better off in the long run. If Mitt Romney had won in 2012, Republicans would certainly be better off. Yeah. Uh, but Democrats might have actually even been better off. So like, couldn't you argue that oftentimes winning is losing and losing is winning? That, that's often true. And you don't know in advance. Normally, it, it's hard to predict which of those elections you know, is the one to win and which is the one not to be there. And by the way, my theory is based on the idea that presidents actually don't have a lot of control over the economic cycle. So I'm assuming in a lot of these cases that the economy is ebbing and flowing along certain paths, regardless of who the president is. And some people may object to that view. You don't know in advance. Trump is different because so many Republicans at the time thought this is a bad idea, but Hillary Clinton or Bill B uh, Joe Biden are so unacceptable, we're better off. And that's the real fallacy. I mean, you don't know how it will shake out between Bush and Gore, and you like Bush and you didn't like Gore, so you go with your preference. But you have people who are, this is a, Trump is being endorsed by people who hate Trump, who think he's a disaster, who think he's a criminal, who think he's unfit for office, but convince themselves the alternatives are so unacceptable. And I'm here just to say the alternatives are not so unacceptable. The alternatives are often actually highly advantageous to you by your own lights. So why would you then rally to someone whom you've said is unfit for office as a constitutional criminal? Why, why do that to yourself? It's not like someone you like, it's someone you don't like. Yeah, I had dinner with a, a smart Republican friend recently, and uh, he's supporting Trump. And, um, you know, I made the argument about Trump being unfit, not having the right character. My son, who was with us, even said, what do you think of Stormy Daniels? <laughs> and to, to this person's credit, uh, he said, uh, that was wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I made the point, I'm like, I'm sure, to my, I'm telling my friend, I'm like, I'm, I'm sure that you said that Bill Clinton yeah. wasn't fit, that character matters, and you probably wanted to impeach Bill Clinton. And, and, uh, and he said, that's true, but, you know, the 90s, though, that was like the end of history. Things were great in the 90s, but but now we just can't afford. We just can't afford that. Things are so serious now. And, um, you know, my I didn't I we didn't get into a big argument, but I don't think I, I, I'm like mind on that point. But what the, the point to say to your friend is to say, look, I, let me grant you, which I do not believe. I mean, I think actually things are. Uh, Pretty, I mean, America's share of the world economy is rising. Um, American, uh, um, you know, Amer I'm not that American society doesn't have serious problems, but I, I don't hold with the apocalyptic thinking. But a lot, I know a lot of people in the more socially conservative world think, oh, my God, we're just going off, off the cliff and uh, women are wearing trousers and dogs are sleeping with cats. It's the end of everything. So let's say you agree with all. That. I'm just saying to them, by your lights, not by mine, by your lights, uh, loot. A Trump loss in 2024 means massive Republican gains in House and Senate and down the ballot in 26. It means a Republican president in 28. And it means an end of the nonstop constitutional crisis. Republican win means um, probably a third impeachment crisis. And do you, do you want to sign up for that? Because Trump's priorities as president, I, Trump doesn't care about stopping women from wearing trousers and stopping dogs from sleeping with cats. What Trump cares about is one, shutting down the American legal system to keep himself out of trouble. Two, shutting down the aid to Ukraine and delivering Ukraine to Russia. And three, starting trade wars with everybody. And I doubt very much that your friend would have any patience for any of those three objectives, which are Trump's objectives. Yeah. Well, like, I don't get the apocalyptic sense. Um, why, I mean, granted, the 90s were pretty awesome, but I don't get why things, why there's the sense that, like, things are so bad now. Maybe it's because I don't watch Fox News. Like, that, that may be the difference. But the other thing is, like, Joe Biden. Like, I'm not a big Joe Biden fan, but I don't see how you could get worked up over Joe Biden. Yeah. Like, I don't know how I could become passionate about Joe Biden or super angry at him. Like, but somehow they've managed to do that. They, they've managed to, to see him as, as, I don't know, this horrible guy. I don't know guy. anything about your friend. I'm guessing that if you really probed him on why the 90s were okay and the 2020s are so terrible, the answer would turn out to be, well, in the 1990s, I was in my 20s, and now I'm in my 50s. <laughs> so one of the real checks I invite people to do, and I say this as a man now in his, his 60s, and as someone with you know some personal woes to deal with, um, is very important not to project yourself 
and your own life cycle on the life cycle of your society. I mean, for each of us past a certain point, the future holds decay leading to extinction. Uh, but that is not true for society in general. Um, and I think there's something that happens, and I see this with older people, you don't want the future to be, your future isn't good. So you don't want the future to be good. I mean, no one wants to hear, you know, um, that cure for Alzheimer's they're working on, th they're going to develop it six years after you die of it. You know, no one wants to hear that. That's, that's, that's very dispiriting information. Um, but uh, I, I, I think a lot of what goes on is people project themselves onto the world. And um, they think the 90s were great because I was young and the 20s are bad because I'm now middle-aged moving toward, toward old age. And that's just, that's psychology. That's not politics. Good advice and good stuff to remember. I want to let's let's move to the Veep stakes. Um, a couple of people, you know, kind of in the news this week. One is JD Vance. There was a big, not big, but there was a profile on him in the New York Times, which I know you were quoted in. And then we have uh, Christy Nome, the South Dakota governor, who has a book out in which she admits to having shot and killed the family dog and goat. The goat doesn't get any attention, by the yeah. way. Nobody cares about the goat. It's all about the dog. Uh, but what are your thoughts on uh, these people and who do you think is in uh, the best position to to be Trump's running mate? Well, think about this. So um, uh, the, J the case for J.D. Vance as Trump's running mate is what if you took all the things that Trump believed and found someone who is younger, smarter, better looking, more disciplined and uh, more lavishly funded by Peter, Peter Thiel to say those same things? You think, well, I can see why. Peter Thiel likes that. And I can see why J.D. Vance likes that. And I can see why some Republican don't. But would Donald Trump like? He's a better you. He's like you, but better. <laughs> He's smarter. He's got more hair. You know, no, that's exactly like, that. Trump is going to look at that guy and say, the moment this, I, what I'm looking for is an abject, cringing toady. And the one thing you know about J.D. Vance, and I knew him very, very well, I, he had his first byline on my website, which is something he publicized, not me, under a pseudonym. Um, this was fr from from Forum. Yeah, he correct? had his first bylaws there under a suit. Uh, is that um, the moment J.D. Vance is the vice president, he will begin scheming against Trump. Uh, that's just uh, that. Tr and Trump, who is a kind of wily survivor, knows that. So I, I don't think I think he will recognize that J.D. Vance at his feet today, at his throat tomorrow. It's not going to be Vance. Christy Nome's project was what if I get like a sexier Donald Trump? And one who's who is put, willing to put in writing that she did something <laughs> so <serious. laughs> um, uh And and Trump would say, uh, you know, I, he's also very, you know, he's very audience aware, um, and would know. Okay, this isn't working. So I I think what you what I my guess is that if, if, what he's looking for is um, above all obedience, humility, and cringing deference. And what he's then looking for is something that fits into his ideas about how the American electorate works. It may not be true ideas, um, but he would think that somebody like Tim Scott might bring him along. He thinks that black voters are moving to him, which is probably not true. Uh, and he thinks that somebody like Tim Scott would move them along. And that's also probably not true, but he would believe those things. And Scott is very deferential. Elise Stefanik, um, very deferential. I think it's going to be somebody like, like that, not, not like Noam or Vance. Do you think that Nome put herself out of the running because of this dog story, or was she always a long shot? No, no pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> no. I can imagine that pre the dog story, um, and and Trump is very swayed by looks, and especially women's looks, so um, not impossible. But the dog story, he would, he yeah, he would, it would just offend his sense of. Um, I mean, he makes mistakes like this all the time, but he doesn't like it when other people. It is interesting. The Gnome dog story and the Mitt Romney Seamus story were both admissions against interest. I think Romney's sons told the story about him putting his dog on the roof of the car for family vacations. And it was Gnome in a book. And yeah. I believe she actually writes something to the effect of like, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but well, well, um, I, they volunteered this. I was talking um, just a couple of days ago to someone who's a very successful professional ghostwriter. And and I said, you should use the gnome example in your career pitch to explain that what, you're, what you celebrity politician are paying me for is not the stuff I put in the book, but the stuff I tell you to keep out of the book. Um, and 
that someone working with no might have said to her, um, I know what you're trying, you're trying to show that you have frontier hardihood and are willing to make the tough decisions and are, are enforcing rules against like chicken killing, um, even at the, uh, at the point of a gun, which is the way you imagine your constituent. But still, all of that said, um, there are many more people who live in suburbs than in the country, and there are many more people who love dogs and want to see frontier justice executed on dogs. Leave it out. I do think if you're a ghostwriter, your incentive is to make the writing flashy and sexy and to get buzz and to sell books. And I don't know if you're thinking about like a political strategist might. So maybe have maybe have your general consultant no, read I, it. I've done a lot of ghostwriting and not a lot, but I've done some. And um, I have been in contention. I, I, well, I, I won't mention the name here as this is going, I'll tell the story in the memoir that I'm someday going to finish, but I was in contention for, um, for a big fee, uh, writing a book for someone who is a very high profile person who's in a lot of trouble. And, um, uh, and we had a long conversation and my advice to that person at the end was not to do it. Um, because I saw no upside, a lot of downside, especially in the way, the, the particular way the person. So yes, you do think like that. Look, the ghostwriter is, um, especially uh, since the early day, uh, since uh, Donald Trump gave away too much of the book to the person who wrote The Art of the Deal, like, ghostwriters are paid by the fee. Um, so you have no incentive to sell books. And what ghostwriters should be thinking about is as an, a good ghostwriter is not just being flashy and having fun and telling the stories. A good ghostwriter is, is actually thinking protectively. You're, you're lawyering as much as you're um, writing. You're, you're saving people from themselves, especially people who don't do this. And especially, look, a lot of people who are famous, celebrity, they, they do have kind of, there is a tendency toward narcissistic personality disorder uh, in these professions, in these lines of work. And so, and people like that don't always understand how they affect, how their actions impinge on others and how they will be perceived. So part of what you're doing when you write for them is helping them to understand, here's how people, here's how you see yourself, but here's how others will see you. So I would not tell this story or not tell it in this way. Um, let's move on to the college campuses, the, uh, the protests, the anti-Semitism, all of that stuff. And I guess this goes back to where we started, Bill Barr thinks the left is much more dangerous than Trump. Um, my my Republican friend certainly would agree. Uh, I don't think it's fair to blame Joe Biden. I don't think these people like Joe <laughs> Biden. Last time I checked, these these leftists are protesting him. But the fact that they are out there, um, I think, reminds sort of normies how how dangerous the radical left actually are. Well, I, I would advise normies to think about it. First, um, uh, the far left, the anti-Israel left hates Biden, and it doesn't seem to hate Trump. So if you belong to the pro-Israel center, and you're judging who uh, who do the people who are most out to harm me and the people I love, who do they hate most? They hate Biden more than they hate Trump, because Biden has stood by Israel. And as someone who's been involved with the U.S.-Israel relationship for a long time now, Biden has done more for Israel at war than any president has ever done for Israel at war. He's gone there. He's No president has ever done it. He's gone there twice. Um, he has sent weapons. Uh, he has um, delivered explicit American security guarantees to Israel against the, its existential threats. So, um, Iran, Hamas is not an existential threat to Israel, but Iran and Hezbollah are, and he sent two carrier groups to deter them. Um, he he engaged in coalition warfare alongside Israel during that missile barrage from Iran into Israel. American warships shot down Iranian weapons. And the United States, I am sure, had a role in the coordination where Israel worked with Jordan and certainly and or probably with Saudi Arabia and probably with the Emiratis to um, stop the barrage. That is, none of that has ever happened before. Nothing like it has ever happened before. So the anti-Israel people are quite right to be as angry at Biden as they are. And the pro-Israel people should be directionally indicated. No, they, they, when the anti-Israel people are trying to help Trump, that's probably something you should pay attention to. Now, the, roof, the other message for normies, I think, is, is this. Um, this is a free society, lots of views, um, and people should vigorously advocate for them. But there are groups of people who do not feel obliged to obey the law while they do it. The, the January 6th people and the campus people are the same. Uh, their views are slightly different but their behaviors are the same. And the great question for free societies is, are you prepared to 
after you made the rules clear, are you prepared to back that, those rules up with the required law enforcement to make the rules stick? And what happened with those uni many university presidents, not all, they're honorable exceptions. Um, you know, uh, Washington University in, um, in St. Louis, the University of Florida, these are places where they, at the University of Texas, that have said, you can't camp on our, you know, the rules are, there's no camping on grounds, no preventing other people from accessing libraries, and your protest must be conducted in a way that doesn't interfere with the functions of the university, which are fundamentally study and teaching. So if you're banging drums at two in the morning in front of dormitories, that's not allowed. And I, we're not suppressing your freedom of speech when you say you can't bang drums. You can't forbid Jewish students to use the library and interpose your body between Jewish students and the library. You can't do that. Uh, those are the rules. And they're, if they're, they weren't clear before, we're going to make them clear now. And if you still don't get it, we're going to suspend you and, ex and if necessary, expel you and if necessary, arrest and charge you. Um, and that is uh, that is the challenge we're dealing with. Um, Peter Navarro defying a congressional subpoena. Um, or uh, these the, uh, these campus protesters. Now, one more thing about the campus protesters, I think what. Um, and YouTube and other things are sort of done. There is a small cadre of people with serious criminal intentions at these things, but most of these people are actually self-indulgent neurotics. And I, I think it's all summed up with that student at UCLA who's in an encampment, preventing other people from using the campus that they have paid money to attend to, that is supported by the state of California and putting placards saying, by the way, while I invade all of your rights, no one within a hundred yards may eat a banana De uh, upwind or downwind of me because I am so acutely sensitive to this uh, to this particular allergy, by the way, which is almost never, I mean, which causes your throat to get a little fuzzy. Um, I'm, I demand the, the most absolute and total deference to my extreme hysterical um, sensitivity while I invade the actual genuine educational rights of everybody in my environment. I, that sort of sums up to me what is really going on here. And um, I think uh, universities need to get serious about saying we, you know, we, we're you're learning institutions, we're in places for free expression, but there are rules, and and if you don't obey them, uh, there are consequences. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, the famed comedian, just turned seventy, and he gave an interview where he had this to say about the left: Nothing really affects comedy. People always need it; they need it uh, so badly, and they don't get it. It used to be you would go home at the end of the day, most people would go, oh, Cheers is on, oh, MASH is on, oh, Mary Tyler Moore is on, All in the Family's on. You just expect it. There'll be some funny stuff we can watch on TV tonight. Well, guess what? Where is it? This is the result of the extreme left and PC crap and people worrying so much about offending other people. Mm -hmm. When you write a script and it goes into four or five different hands, committees, groups, Here's our thought about this joke. Well, that's the end of your comedy. Well, basically what he says, you probably know this spiel, is that you can't, uh, that, that, that political correctness and liberalism, progressivism, has basically undermined comedy because you write a joke and these people have to sign off on it. And then you send it to someone else who has to sign off on it. Uh, and by the time it gets through all the vetting, it's not a joke anymore. Yeah. I think there's a more fundamental problem, which is I think the particular variant of, of progressivism we have now regards humor as essentially an improper activity um, because uh, what, what humor is a way it is always subversive. It, it, it takes some norm or code or authority or respected person and it says, you know, what, this is belongs to the same common rock of humanity as everybody else. Um, when you have a movement that is about asserting pieties and punishing people who disagree with them, obviously humor is going to be not what they, uh, they, they want. Um, it, uh, and in fact, so many of the moments at these protests remind me of scenes from Monty Python. You know, they do this thing where they, they call it the human microphone, that the leader will say something and everybody will repeat it. And it's like that scene of life in Brian, where Brian tries to tell you, you are all individuals. And, yes, we are all individuals. You're all <laughs> yes, we are all different. And, and this banana business, it, there, there is a Monty Python sketch about how to defend yourself against a man armed only with a banana. And the joke is, you know what? If a man is armed only with a banana, you don't have a lot to fear. Uh, but somehow, as in the Monty Python sketch, they've made a man armed with a banana the most terrifying thing they can imagine. Um, 
Maybe the most terrifying thing is RFK Jr. I'm not sure. But uh, David, a lot of us thought initially that RFK Jr. posed a threat to Joe Biden that you know, Donald Trump can only get 46 percent. That's kind of his his ceiling. Um, and so it, the way that Biden loses is a third party candidate. That's kind of the way that's what happened in 2016. That's the way Biden loses. But now it's starting to look like RFK is more likely to steal votes from Donald Trump. What do you make of this? Um, I, I don't quite buy it. Um, so third party candidates um, can have impacts in, in, in two main ways. The first way is they are genuinely actually, they, they genuinely ignite some kind of mass movement the way Ross Perot did in 1992 and the way um, George Wallace did in 1968. And Wallace cost the Democrats, he pulled away the uh, old segregation of South away from the New Deal coalition and it collapsed and then the New Deal coalition was never repaired again. Um, uh, Ross Perot attracted more secular, conservative-leaning people and destroyed the Reagan coalition, and which was never really properly put together again. The other way they have an impact is Ralph Nader in Florida, which is you're not getting that much of the vote, but you get it in a strategic in a, from a strategic group at a strategic place. So I think there's no evidence of Bobby Kennedy Jr. igniting the first, and it will take a lot of luck for him to have an impact on on the second. Um, uh, I, my guess is that he has his biggest appeal in places that are not going to be all that strategic in uh, 2024. So what I'm paying attention to is his super PAC, which is raising a lot of money from Trump oriented donors and which Bobby Kennedy Jr. will not control uh, and is controlled by Trump oriented donors. So the ads, if they are successful and continue to, and I think they've raised about $20 million. Now that in the scheme of a presidential election, that's not so very much. But if they continue to be, be a route, for, if they can send to Trump donors, you know, we're actually more responsible managers of anti-Biden dollars than the Trump campaign is. We steal less. Um, <laughs> and then that super PAC could become an important source of anti-Biden advertising and messaging. And I, that, that's, I think, what the function and goal of that super PAC is. Uh, and again, it's not under Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s direct control. He seems to have his own, he seems to believe his own mythology. Uh, but I don't think his donors do. All right, let's take a quick break. And I just want to encourage you, if you like what we do here, please go to patreon.com slash Matt Lewis and support us. Uh, there's also some cool merch you can get. We've got a coffee mug that frankly I love. I use all the time and an autographed copy of one of my books like Too Dumb to Fail or Filthy Rich Politicians. And of course, the most important part, you'll be helping us do what we do here. Thank you in advance. And let's get back to the show. So one of the big, I don't know, subplots right now or, or kind of B list stories, I think, is uh, should Joe Biden, will Joe Biden, should Joe Biden debate Donald Trump this fall? Um, I think there's a sense that Biden can't, that he just wouldn't have the stamina to to debate an hour and a half at nine o'clock Eastern time and, and hold his own against Trump. On the other hand, you know, last time around, Trump didn't perform so well. He, he turned a lot of people off. What's your take? Should Biden yeah. get in there or or try to avoid it? Well, I've written that Biden, I've written an article saying that Biden should not. Um, as to whether he can, um, I think the most recent State of the Union shows he can perform. Um, and he's, uh, I think we can all see he's not performing as nimbly as he performed when he uh, debated Sarah Palin in 2008 or Paul Ryan in 2012. Um, but he did well on the stage in 2020 against his Democratic rivals. He did well on the stage against Donald Trump in 2020. And he did that big, very impressive State of the Union in 2024. So um, he can do it. And meanwhile, Trump is also a deteriorating target. When, um, that. Trump used to sometimes be funny um, and Trump used to sometimes talk one of the, when you look, go back and look at Trump's speeches from 2015, especially the first six months of his campaign, he would talk about things like opioids that uh, nobody was, it, it's remarkable. People were dying, beginning to die in very large numbers from opioids in that year. They, the, the, the plague really gets going about 2012, 13, but the, the death toll begins to rise 2014, 15. And, 
Um, I, in my first Trump book, I did a count of the number of times that the word opioid appeared in the New York Times in the year 2015 versus the number of occasions in which they used the word transgender. And I'm, it was like 50 to one. And not to dismiss the importance of anybody's cause, but the point was opi the opioid epidemic was invisible to the upper American upper class in 2015. Trump talked about it all the time. Not all the time, but often. He didn't have any solutions. He just said it. He just acknowledged that it was happening, and that meant something to people. He, he talked about immigration. Again, he didn't have great solutions, but he talked about something people cared about. What does he talk about now? Him, himself, yep. his grievances, his woes, his troubles. Um, he reminds me, there's a scene in one of my favorite books, The Long Goodbye, where um, the Raymond Chandler's uh, private detective character, Philip Marlowe, bids farewell to um, a friend by saying, you talk too goddamn much, and too goddamn much of it is about you. And that's, I think, the reaction to Trump. So I don't think he will be an effective debater. But the reason why Biden shouldn't do it is not because of capacity. And it's not because Trump is rude, and it's not because Trump tried to give him COVID in 2020. It's because um, I don't think presidents should do events with felons. Um, and by the time of the debate, Trump is very likely to be a convicted felon. I don't think presidents should do events with people who have incited anti-constitutional criminality. And Trump has incited, done that. And by the fall, he will likely be on trial for it. He may not be convicted yet, but he will likely be on trial. Those are just people that um, the president shouldn't do joint appearances with. Um, you know, you know, he shouldn't, the president, there are certain courtesies that are owed to the nominee of a major party. Uh, and that's a strong presumption. But Trump will be a convicted felon, very likely, by the fall. And he will be on trial for crimes against the Constitution. And a president shouldn't be on the stage with him. I think that's a great answer. And I hope that the Biden team can as succinctly as you have, make that case. Uh, but that makes a lot of sense to me. David, from anything, uh, final thoughts or anything you want to plug? Oh, um, no, I don't, I don't have anything uh, to plug. I, I do want to say I, I've heard, I, I, as some of the viewers will know, I, I, we've had a terrible bereavement in my family. And I wrote about it for The Atlantic. And I've had so many messages of, of support uh, from people, uh, some I know, some I don't know. And one of the things I have learned from those lessons, and this is the thing I would, I'm trying to share now with a lot of people, a common theme of so many of the messages is how people similarly situated, similarly bereaved, have felt so alone in their grief. And so um, I'm doubly resolved now whenever the next time I hear about anything like this to reach out to people. You, um, it really is true that we live in a lonely society and grief is a very isolate and grief is an especially isolating experience. And, um, and I thank, so I thank everyone who's reached out to me and I just learned the lesson of how terribly alone people are and how we should all be working more to connect ourselves with others in their times of pain. Well said. And this is nothing compared to what you've been through, David, but today is, I just put up a Facebook post this morning. Today's the 20th anniversary of my dad's passing. Um, and I put up, you know, I didn't, I don't tweet about it, but I put up a, a Facebook post because that's where his friends and family will see it. I want to remember him. Um, and I'm getting uh, people who are commenting and it means so much. Yeah. And I used to think when I was younger that if someone had a tragedy, you should just don't talk about it. Don't bring it up. Yeah. Try to cheer them up. Talk about something else. But one thing that I've really learned is people want to talk about their loved ones and they want to talk and uh, bring it up, yeah. say something, see something, say something. Yeah. Um, so we've been praying for you, David. And yeah. uh, I, it's, it's, uh, it's a horrible thing, but you know, you are a great person and uh, I know, I know it's been tough though. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, you have your homework assignment, everybody. Um, you know, reach out to somebody that you love uh, and uh, send them a text. Call them. Pick up the phone. Give them a call. Talk to them. David Fromm, it is always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Perfect.